Okay, welcome back. Uh, welcome to week 10. This week we turn to what is in effect a kind of a correspondence between uh, Newton and Bentley. This is Richard Bentley, who is a, uh, he's a theologian. He's a, 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 a working member of the Church of England in the upper echelons, um, but also holds himself out for what, you know, in, in the times were considered to be a sort of a, a theologically inspired natural philosopher. Uh, like Newton himself is. I mean, Newton's got a lot of different jobs. I mean, inventing the calculus, um, which I'll talk some more about in a bit, running the, the mint, um, uh, the royal mint in, in England at the time, uh, and of course, publishing his physical theories, which is which are you know, what he's most known for. You know, Newton is the apple far from the, fall from the tree, hit him on the head, he discovers gravity guy from the cartoons, right? Um, Newton and Bentley were friends and allies. Um, they form, or they're part of a, a world of um, uh, primarily English philosophers who um, populated the Royal Society in England, which is the, the scientific society founded um, earlier in the 17th century to, um, inspired by the ideas of Francis Bacon, to investigate uh, natural phenomena, all phenomena, actually supernatural phenomena, pre preternatural phenomena, and so on. Um, Newton is Newton by this point is a big shot in the Royal Society, um, a very very big shot in the Royal Society. Uh, although he hasn't yet published his his Principia, that hasn't, which is the big physical book, that hasn't come out yet. But um, he and Bentley are um, part of sort of this army of people who give these. In particular, Bentley is giving. Um, um, a series, a, a set of lectures in a series that are devoted to um, defeating atheism. The, the, the whole, it's like an endowed, we would say it's like an endowed series. It was an endowed series of lectures. Different guys gave it, you know, at different, in different years. Um, Bentley's sermons, they're called sermons, um, uh, they're lectures and they're sermons because sermons were lectures uh, in, 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 the, in Protestant uh, Britain, really, uh, uh, at the time. Um, they tended to be lectures, depending on, you know, how fancy the guy, given them where it was. Uh, Bentley's giving these lectures, which are sermons. We, I asked you guys to read Sermon 8 in this series. And each series of lectures, each, each set of lectures in the series is supposed to uh, uh, push back on um, arguments for atheism derived primarily from natural philosophy, very much along the lines um, that we've seen or that I've suggested to you so far in, in these lectures that we're having uh, for this class. So Bentley writes eight sermons in confutation of atheism that are published, delivered, and then published in 1692, so in the, in the 1690s. Um, you know, he gives them over a period of time, and later, and later they're collected and published together. Well, partway through this, his, his uh, writing of these individual sermons in this series of eight, he and Newton have an exchange of letters. We don't have Bentley's letters. We have Newton's side of the correspondence. That's the, that's the excerpt from Newton I asked you guys to read. So he's replying to Bentley's letters and you know putting out his Newton's views of the same subject. Now, these guys are on the same team. They share the same views. What their, what their discussion amounts to is I mean, Newton is correcting Bentley on the physics, what he sees as the physics, um, but he's also correcting him on metaphysical assumptions, assumptions about the nature of the world that aren't necessarily, you know, that aren't verifiable one way or the other in this period by, um, by observational empirical philosophy. So Newton, I mean, Newton's a, he's a scientist, he's a, he's a big science guy, right? But he's also, um, he's also a devout believing Christian of a certain strand, a certain substrand of, of, of Protestantism, Protestant Christianity, so it's Western Christianity, Protestant branch, Newton's sort of sub-branch. Um, he wasn't fully public with these views because they were a little controversial, but he's like a very seriously religious guy. He's also an alchemist. He was big on um, alchemy, which is a, now a discredited uh, uh, empirical physicalist um, theory of the of the nature of, of, of certain of, of certain physical substances and elements and so on alchemy you know the, the the cartoon version of alchemy is that these people are constantly trying to find ways to turn lead into gold um, Newton was a bit as a big alchemist which is something that we didn't you know what people didn't know generally until fairly recently and, and in popular terms people don't know this about Newton um, so they're on the same team and they are working out the kinks of their arguments 
yes, for the physics, but primarily against um, the threat of atheism. And as I suggested to you earlier in the semester, very early in the semester, they were right to be nervous because what we have now is a secular physics that, for, unless, you know, except, you know, in, with exceptions in the case of individual physicists and their particular individual beliefs, is a, is a, is a completely irreligious, speculative, hard science. It doesn't involve theological views or metaphysical views quite in that way. Um, uh, but Newton, for, for these guys, that line isn't drawn, no one's drawing it, and in fact they're doing everything they can to keep, hold, it, hold it together, to hold science tightly in the theology so science doesn't take off and do exactly what it did, which was make it possible to explain the world without the activity or the effort or the planning of the monotheistic Judeo-Christian Islamic God, which is what you know these guys are hell-bent, as it were, <laughs> on keeping basically keeping God in that picture. And so, you know, and that's why, you know, I've, what I've suggested to you this semester, this is, this is what drives much of the philosophy in this period. And if it doesn't drive it, it certainly influences it, um, which is, you know, big question of the class here, sort of just past the halfway point, you know, what's modern about modernity? Well, not this part, maybe so much. Um, so, yeah, and I'll say some more about that here in just a bit. So we're going to look at Bentley first because he's, even though sermons 7 and 8 were actually delivered and were, you know, finalized and delivered after his exchange with Newton, um, I want to give you an overview of the lecture series and then we'll look at Bentley and then we'll get into some of those details. So, um, eight sermons preached at Boyle's le lectures. Robert Boyle is a very famous um, empirical scientist. He's the guy who does all of the experiments with... Um, vacuum tubes and the air pump and so on, demonstrating sort of what we would consider to be very basic physical science insights about the nature of air and um, uh, and pressure and temperature and the, the relationship of these things. It's very, very early science. So, you know, this is science in its early days. Robert Boyle is a hugely important figure. He's also a member of the aristocracy and he's got money. And um, he endows this series of lectures um, in confutation of atheism, you know, in, in the refutation of atheism. At least that's how the Royal Society takes the mission. Um, in the eight, the eight sermons, the overview of the eight sermons, we only read Sermon 8. Um, in the first sermon, Bentley just tells us all the different forms of atheism. And what it, it, if, if we were to look at it, what it sounds like is it's a list of all the ways you could have a physical account of the origin and nature of the world that didn't refer to theological causes. So, I mean, it's a, it's a very specific kind of atheism. Um, in um, the second sermon, uh, what Bentley does is the second lecture, what Bentley does is uh, he argues the case against atheism from the soul and from the fact that matter can't think. This is, um, this is, uh, the, the, he's, he's invoking um, the, the dualism that we saw both in Amo and um, Anton Wilhelm Amo and in Descartes, the separation between mind and body. Uh, you know, I'll remind you about some of those features about what that means in terms of the physical matter that these guys are going to be talking about. Um, but the gist of it is mind is distinct from matter and matter can't think. The claim that matter can't think is a crucial premise. It's a crucial premise in the broader argument. So just bear that in mind, is that matter is, matter is as, as, as I've said to you guys um, several times over the last few weeks, matter is inert. It's not active in itself on this, on this view. And one of the actions it can't engage in is thinking, is thinking. Um, sermons three through five are arguments against atheism made on the basis of observations about the structure and origin of human bodies. And there are a whole bunch of uh, different arguments and, and, and takes on this. It takes, you know, three whole sermons and lectures. If you were to read them, they would sound like um, sort of quaint, old-fashioned versions of um, the design argument from, you know, from, from, from the way our eyes work or, the fact, you know, the two hands. Bentley spends a lot of time talking about, you know, the two distinct but stable over time forms, male and female. All of these, all, you know, all, bi all the biological formal stuff, the, all observations you could make about human bodies, males, females, the eyes, the organs, hands, all these things, um, basically saying, isn't this great? It couldn't, it couldn't happen. It, ha it has to have a designer. I mean, because all of this is in some form or another um, a version of the design argument that you guys are familiar with in terms of creationism or in intelligent design. Um, lecture six through eight 
we read we read the last one we read eight make the same case against atheism from what Bentley calls the origin and frame of the world and as we see in um, in sermon eight I mean he's talking in general about um, the physical world very much a lot very much um, uh, the same subject matter although with a completely different position that Descartes has was presenting to us in the treatise on light in his the world right um, and in Sermon 8, what we see is a focus on the solar system and the bodies in the solar system as an argument against, again, against atheism uh, uh, in, in, in Bentley's terms. So that's the overview of the lecture series. That's the context for, for Sermon 8, for Lecture 8 that we're, um, that we're reading, that we, I asked you guys to read. Um, sorry, there are lots of little sub-posters with this lecture. Uh, that's our first addendum. And also, this is the stage where we transition from landscape back to vertical. Um, so there's some, there's some mixed media in terms of paper size today. Uh, so following on um, the dualism we see in Descartes and Amo and um, Barclay's response to some of the concerns that he has there by just rejecting matter altogether and only saying there is only spirit, uh, the, which is, you know, we saw that the little version of that argument in the, in the second explication you guys just did. Substance, spirit is the only substance. There is no other subsisting, substantial thing but spirit. No matter, no material, no particles, none of that, right? That's Barclay's reaction to Descartes' dualism. Bentley takes those concerns and that, what, what at this point in the later part of the 17th century is a big conversation about this, and makes what is a considerable contribution. He, you know, he, Newton is really the, the guy who's doing the heavy lifting here philosophically. I mean, Newton himself isn't that great a philosopher, but let's, let's say he's B-list and Bentley's kind of C-list. Um, Bentley's more a, a, a sort of a minion. That said, Bentley makes really sort of over the top, totally explicit arguments, um, what, what people today uh, refer to as saying the quiet part out loud. He says stuff that Newton wouldn't say because Newton, you know, he'd get blowback from like fancy people and Bentley's like, you know, he's got this nice big job in the Church of England. He doesn't care about their blowback. He's he's here for the theological argument. He doesn't have to he doesn't have to maintain his cred with um, hard scientists or emerging hard scientists the way that Newton does. Um, Newton, Newton's got a different set of opponents than um, than Bentley does. We'll see a little bit more about what that will look like. Um, not in, well, we'll see a little bit more about what that will look like when we shift next week to the Leibniz-Clark correspondence, because uh, Clark is another friend of Newton's and another pal of Newton's. They were actually neighbors, um, and they disagree with Leibniz. We'll talk about how they disagree with Leibniz. Um, there, everybody's being a lot more careful. Bentley, the nice thing about Bentley is he says all that crazy stuff in print and just like puts it all out there. Um, and you can see that difference a little bit in um, Bentley's sermon versus, which you know was delivered publicly and it was you know part of this endowed scientific lecture. But then, and Newton's private letters to Bentley, you know, people aren't seeing this when they're alive, right? Or when Newton's alive. Um, he's a lot more careful than Bentley is in his letters. He's more, what we say, circumspect. He doesn't, he doesn't take big risks in the claims he's making. And he's a little bit more aware of the possibility of you know, philosophical criticism or natural philosophical criticism or scientific criticism than Bentley is. Bentley's kind of um, coasting on, he's in, he's in, um, in Newton's um, backdraft. He's in, he's in Newton's uh, slipstream, um, just kind of going along behind him scientifically and philosophically. So. Bentley, Eight Sermons Against Atheism, 1692, we read Sermon 8. He's, as I've said, a theologian making scientific arguments, which he's largely getting from Newton, among others. Um, he's worried, as I said, about scientific accounts of the world that make God seem superfluous, unnecessary. You know, you could explain the world without God, right? And he focuses on two main forms of those arguments. I mean, through the eight lectures, he's focusing on particular versions of these forms, but these are the two, these are two, these are the two main forms he's worried about. And what he's doing here is he's looking back on almost a century of, or a century or more of argument on this subject, and he's now trying to give us a classification, a taxonomy of the kinds of atheism, the kinds of science without God, that these guys have to combat. And he's, he's trying to be, make it more efficient, make the, the criticism more efficient by putting, you know, by, you know, putting several of these positions under, you know, sort of these two heads, these two types of argument, and he can defeat the two types of argument. 
in Sermon 7, which I didn't ask you guys to read, he actually, he actually makes a case that they're the same kind of argument in the end. I'm not, we, won't, we don't need to get into that level of detail, but um, the two forms are going to be crucial to both to, you know, our reflections on Descartes' Treatise on Light in his The World book, um, and also in, in the weeks to come when we're looking at um, Leibniz, the Leibniz-Clark correspondence. So these are the two forms. One form of atheistical, scientific account of the world gives a, me a, a mechanical explanation that relies on the laws of nature. And Bentley refers to this in his shorthand as necessity. And this is, it's important to remember this because Clark is going to use that same term in the correspondence with Leibniz. He's going to refer to this same kind of explanation as, you know, an argument from necessity. Or he'll just, he'll even, because they're, because they're writing letters to each other, um, he'll even just say, well, that's necessity. It's totally shorthanded, right? Well, like, well, what does he mean by that? Mechanical explanations of the world and everything in it that rely on the laws of nature. Now, your mind should be going, wait a minute, Kathy. Descartes gave us a, me a mechanical explanation of the world and everything in it, relying on the law of nature, laws of nature, but he was like, you know, God's at the back of it, right? So you can see these are, this is sort of like, you know, this is a, this is a, this is a, a group with a general shared theological view that is having disagreements primarily, well, partly about like what the world is actually like. I don't want to suggest these guys actually don't care about getting it right about the world, about, you know, the, you know, the description of, and the scientific account of the phenomena, but pretty much either a close second or in Bentley's case, way first is, um, is you know who's better at fighting the atheists, and we'll see that this is basically the 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 the, the top line dispute in the Leibniz Clark correspondence is which one of them is giving more ground to atheism, uh, which one of them is more dangerous to theological to to, to, to religious doctrine, um, to theological accounts of the world, whose phil whose philosophy is 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 scarier and worse, and bad for religion than the other guy. So this is this is you know this is the big fight they're having, <laughs> and so. Um, so Bentley here is he's he's describing Descartes. I mean he's also describing ancient you know, sort of pre-Christian Greek um, uh, figures who d do describe the world in mechanical you know things crashing into each other and shooting off in various directions. The Atomist is one example. Um, mecha mechanical explanation relying on the laws of nature. So there are plenty of pre-Christian guys who who have this view. But he's also talking about Descartes who was nonetheless giving us an account of the world that very much depended on God and God's actions. Um, by the time Bentley is writing, people aren't as persuaded by that. And there were people, there were, there were in fact people at the time when Descartes' physical views were published, when the, when the Treatise on Light was published, and afterwards, you know, they said, look, B Descartes, this is, this is a dangerously atheistical argument. And, you know, people will debate about whether Descartes meant it that way or not and so on. I, I think it's pretty clear that in the world he means it. Um, but again, even that's a complicated thing. I won't drag you through all those details. So this is criticizing both the ancient atomists as well as people like Descartes, mechanical explanation relying on the laws of nature. It all comes under this little tagline, necessity. So you need to remember what this is when we hit the Leibniz-Clark correspondence and Clark says, well, that's just necessity. So what does he mean? He means this. The second, the second, um, type of atheistical argument, and I know I, I suggested that atomism comes under this, but it, it also comes under this other uh, form. Physical explanations relying on the attributes of particles of matter, aka atomism, aka chance. Now, Descartes gave us a physical explanation relying on the attributes of particles of matter in his mechanical explanation relying on the laws of nature. So there's, uh, there's clearly overlap here. That is, there are going to be ar arguments that Bentley considers atheistical that show up in two different forms. The reason he splits this up is that he's got a counter argument for each of these two aspects. Whether this, you know, it's one, you know, Descartes comes under both of them, that's fine, as long as Bentley, in his view, is defeating both of these as atheistical aspects. Physical explanations relying on the attributes of particles of matter a.k.a. atomism, this, what he's referring to here are the ancient atomists, the Epicureans, Lucretius, um, and the people who in the early modern period picked, you know, revived those views, like Gassendi, um, for example, and said, hey, look, this is a pretty good way to explain physical phenomena, um, where the atomism, unlike Descartes' particles of matter, 
aren't operating under laws of nature given to the world by God, you know, imposed on the world by God, but instead are just doing what whatever it is that matter does in motion so that what happens comes about, Bentley says, as a result of chance. Now, there's a dimension of this in Epicureanism, so it's not, Bentley's not inventing this out of the blue. It's, it's there, but it's also, um, he's, also being, he's also being a kind of a bigot in the sense that he's describing all atomisms as uh, involving, involving, involving chance, lawlessness. Now, you guys, we, living in you know, the early 21st century, should have in our minds another possibility that you could have laws of nature that affected the way stuff went where we couldn't be sure that those laws of nature were imposed on the world by a, a, a monotheistic, all-powerful, all-knowing, um, om, omnipresent God. You, you, you know, if, you're, if you are a religious person, you may not port those ideas all the way over to your scientific explanations, and you're well aware of the fact that people have different views and that we can nonetheless do science together without, you know, getting, getting all hung up on the differences in our religious perspectives. Um, so that, that's a third option here. That's a third option here that Bentley is um, intentionally excluding. So in effect, what these guys are doing is, what Bentley is doing, for those of you who've had um, criti critical thinking and you've studied fallacies, Bentley at, sort of a, at, a, at, a, at a very sort of um, larger structural level is making a, a, a false alternative. He's making an argument based on a false alternative. Either these physical explanations rely on laws of nature where those laws necessarily determine. This is also determinism. It's determinism, it's necessity. Um, determining the outcomes, which presents problems for the, for, the, for the free will and the problem of evil stuff that I talked to you guys about last time when, when I was telling you about um, Descartes, why, why Descartes had, develops the view he does of God's relationship to, the, the, to matter in the material world. Um, or, if it's not necessity, it's chance, meaning um, physical explanations relying on the, par the attributes of particle of matter where the particles are, it, it, it's an atomism, so it's, in this case it's unlike Descartes where everything's full, these are the atoms crashing around in empty space so that what emerges happens by chance rather than under the laws of nature. It is crucial to understand that for Bentley and for Newton, as well as for Clark when we get there, that it is, it is these, these guys rely heavily on this alternative. Either something is a determinism, necessity, which violates the premise of free will and gives us problems with the problem of evil, right? Or everything is owing to chance. So it's like, um, it's like throwing dice or playing cards or flipping a coin. Um, we know, because we grew up in a world where there were other alternatives, or one other really big alternative with lots of variations, it doesn't have to, we don't have to be hard bound by these two alternatives. It's either all determinism or it's all chance. The form of the design argument that Bentley and Newton and Clark make, however, relies on cabining, confining the possibilities to these two kinds to, to, to either necessity or chance. That's how they launch their, their metaphysical views of the world on, on, on their terms, on their terms, which we'll see today. Um, now, now, um, what Bentley does then with these two, classific these two classifications of types of atheistical argument, he defeats necessity and again, this is going to be really crucial when we get to the Leibniz-Clark correspondence, he de defeats necessity by saying, by showing that things could have been otherwise. Here are the forms male and female, um, consistent through ages of, you know, human life. It could easily be the case that every generation, um, uh, children are born in various forms and, and mature in various ways, and so one generation is able to reproduce, but the other one isn't. The next generation isn't. He shows that because we can imagine the alternative, the alternative is thus possible. So because it's Im the, the alternatives are imaginable, basically making reproduction impossible, right? Um, 
or, or imagine that the Earth orbited much closer to the sun and it would be too hot and you couldn't live on the surface of the planet or there wouldn't be an atmosphere, it all burned off, right? We can imagine that, we can, we can conceive it. Bentley says, if, if, it's, if it's possible it could have been otherwise, it means that it's not necessary. What, what we see in the actual world isn't necessary, it isn't determined, it's not, it, it isn't being driven by necessity of the laws of nature. It could have been otherwise. It could go either way. Um, that's, that's how he defeats the, the necessity side, his necessity type of atheistical argument. He defeats the chance atheist by showing that there is in fact particular order and arrangements in the natural world that are good. So for example, the fact that you know generation after generation male and female forms are born so that reproduction is possible. Um, the fact that our eye is constructed the way it is, constructed the way it is, designed the way it is, is good for us. Um, the fact that the earth is, is, and you see this in Sermon 8, this far from the sun but not too far. I, I call this, I call it, I shorthand this, this is the thing that physicists talk about when they talk about solar systems and planets. This is, you know, this is the Goldilocks planet, I mean, right? This is it's neither, neither too close to the sun nor too far out. <coughs> Bentley shows that where there are these things that could have been otherwise, if they're good, that's evidence for providence. Providence meaning somebody thought to provide. That's what prov the word providence means. Somebody meaning somebody really powerful and big and perfect and fabulous thought to provide providence of a benevolent and intel intelligent creator, a.k.a. God. The, the Judeo-Christian Islamic monotheistic God in particular, in this case the Western Christian Protestant God. Um, that, so, so that's how Bentley defeats the chance atheist. If we see particular orders and arrangements that have, that, are, that, that have good effects, that are good for us or good for something, then it means that somebody was like, oh, this would be good. Because it can't just happen that way. It, it can't just happen that way. Because it could have been otherwise. It's not necessary. Um, and because it didn't go the other way, by chance, then if it's good, it meant somebody planned it and thought about it. That's the, that's the generic version of the, of the argument against atheism that Bentley's making. God chooses particular arrangements, and that choice explains the world. We refer to that choice that God makes to make things this way as opposed to that way. Could have been otherwise, but God picks this one. We refer to that choice um, we, we, we refer to that choice in order to explain the way the world actually is, and we don't refer to mechanism or chance. Now, um, you're thinking, wait a minute, Newton sounds like a, like a mechanical philosopher. Okay, he also is going to sound a bit like an atomist philosopher. When we get to Newton, we'll see this. There is empty space. They're disagreeing with Descartes that there is no void. They think lots of void and lots of empty space. Bentley actually gives us that argument in Sermon 8. Um, and there's matter sort of moving around in that empty space. Well, that sounds a lot like atomism. It also sounds a lot like a mechanical explanation of the world relying on laws of nature because, I mean, what's Newton without law of gravity and his other physical laws, right? And, you know, the laws developed by Kepler and, um, uh, and, and Gal Galileo and these other people, right? So Newton's nobody without that. Um, this, is, this is also we would say, in our world, we would say, this is also spin. This is spin. These guys, Bentley and all of these guys, have got themselves hooked up with a really serious physicist, namely Isaac Newton, who's delivering really heavy duty, really successful, very successful. I mean, it held the fort in Western science until, until Einstein, right? More or less. Um, I mean, this was a very successful, is still a very successful physical account of the world, what Newton gives us. The problem is, it sounded a lot like those older mechanical and or atomistic theories of the physical world. So all of this assault on atheism is also image polishing. It's also, you know, going out on social media and saying, oh yeah, I know it looks like I'm saying that, but I'm not really saying that. I mean, you guys know about that in the media world, in our media world. People do this all the time. They want to say something but they don't want to be seen as saying that. And so they have this big PR campaign. It's like, oh no, I'm not saying that. Oh, no, 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 no. So a lot of what we're seeing here is PR. Okay, that, that is, these guys are like, 
given mechanical explanations of the world, and it sounds a lot like laws of nature and necessary, I mean, gravity, the whole thing, I mean, it's pretty necessary for us, right? Let go of something, it falls to the ground, it seems pretty necessary. Um, it, you know, and there are, there, are, there, are, you know, there are a lot of features of Newton's physical science that sound a lot like these views that Bentley is criticizing as atheistical. Yes, okay, so what we're seeing is, what we're seeing is a newer science, that is a newer, a more recent development in, the, in, in science. Science is older now, it's like in college, whereas before we were seeing it as an infant or as, as an adolescent, we were, when we were looking at, you know, astrological theories that were scientific and so on. These guys, you know, this is a hundred some odd years later, these guys, they've been working on it all this time, They're, it's much more heavy duty in terms of the science, that poses an even bigger threat to the theological doctrines. It's even more dangerous, which means that even as these guys are delivering he heavier, dutier science, they have to spin like crazy the fact that, oh no, no, but it's all still a theological account of the world. So that's what Bentley is doing. That's what Newton is doing. That's what Clark is defending in the Leibniz-Clark correspondence. And we're gonna hold off on Leibniz in terms of seeing what he's doing later on. Okay. Just to remind you, backdrop for Bentley's argument in the um, quarrel between the ancients and the moderns, this takes us all the way back to the beginning of the semester. Again, just, and I, I've mentioned this several times, the medieval adoption and adaptation of Aristotle's metaphysics to Christian theology in, carried out by the scholastics or the schoolmen, we're going to continue to see references to these guys, I just want to remind you what we're talking about. But there was one really big exception here. Um, the scholastic the scholastics rejected Aristotle's prohibition on a vacuum or empty space. Descartes accepted it. This was one of the one of the points on which Descartes agreed with Aristotle. I mean, he rejected other things about Aristotle, as we saw the last couple, in you know, in the last two lectures. Um, but um, they he, he he kept he preserved Aristotle's prohibition of a vacuum or empty space. So the notion of what, 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 what they call in this period a plenum, meaning everything is full, plenty, plenitude, plenum. Everything is full, no empty space. We saw this, you guys saw this with De in both, in, you know, in, in the whole of Descartes' treatise on light that we read, right? Um, Newton, in particular, and his followers, Bentley, Clark, and the other Royal Society um, physics guys, science guys, rejected this. They rejected Aristotle's prohibition on empty space, and of course that put, you know, they ha then they have to show, as I was just suggesting, they have to say, yes, but we're not Epicureans, we're not Gassendi, we're not atomists, we're not, we're not making the fortuitous atoms clashing in the void. That's the way Bentley and all these guys put this. They're, they're not making that argument, they're not doing that, not doing that. They have a problem, though, because they've rejected Aristotle's prohibition on a vacuum, and they said there's lots of empty space. And again, you guys saw that argument in chapter eight. Bentley gives us this this account of like, well, if there if there if if this much space between the planets and the galaxies and all the rest of this wasn't empty, it would weigh a lot, and it doesn't seem to weigh a lot. So it has to be empty. And that's a very uh, hit and run version of that argument. Um, why is a vacuum necessary to these people? This is going to be, again, another crucial piece for the dispute between Leibniz and Clark. So note this down, okay? I'm going to remember this. A vacuum is necessary for God to be able to move the universe one way or the other as a whole. It's also necessary for God to be able to, like, move stuff around in the universe, like, you know, maybe make the moon a little further out, make the moon a little further in. Um, most importantly, though, a vacuum is, or a void, empty space, is super crucial because God needs to be able to have chosen to put the universe here as opposed to there. And he needs to be able to have chosen, and we'll see this, we'll see this in Clark's argument extensively, he needs to have created the, had the option to create the universe now or a year earlier or a year later. And you're thinking, how can you have years without universes? Yes, time, time really produces real fun and exciting puzzles on this. But the, but the point holds in terms of the physical theory. 
they needed a vacuum because God has to have the option of, of, of not only creating the universe over here as opposed to over there, but if he wants to, once he's created it, moving it back or moving it forward or up, down or up or down or any of these other positions. God has to have those options. I'll talk some more a bit later about why God has to have those options, and we'll see it in particular with Clark. It forms one of the main disputes he has with Leibniz, so this is crucial. Um, so for these guys, they had to reject a plenum. They have to assert a vacuum in empty space. They're all empty space guys. Newtonian physics is an empty space physics. It's all empty. Um, Bentley's metaphysics, like Newton's, and as we'll see, like Clark's, sees matter as essentially inert and inactive. Now, there, Descartes agrees with them. For Descartes, matter is inert. It has certain states that it's in. It has, it has shape and size and direction and motion. These particles and the bodies they form have all those states that they're in. But matter itself is essentially inert and inactive, which is why for Descartes, God has to put it into motion. That particular view is unsatisfying and, and uh, uh, unacceptable to Newton. Newton actually, um, in, in, in the second part of his Principia, which is published after, is, is published about, uh, it's published about 10, 15 years after this, this sort of series of lectures in the correspondence, Newton, in the second part of the Principia, refutes Descartes' theory of the vortices. He shows why mo the assertion that everything is moving in a, in, 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 in a multiple vortices, vortexes, in a vortex and in multiple vortices, doesn't, it, 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 it basically violates one of Kepler's laws of motion. And that was a very heavy-duty empirical observational um, defeat of Descartes' theory of vortices. So these guys, I mean, they, 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 they disagree with Descartes in, the, in those terms, but they agree, they share Descartes' view that matter is inert and it has to be put into motion. Um, remember, Amo saw matter this way also. Matter is completely passive. It has it has nothing. It is it is it's inert. It's it's basically dead. It doesn't it doesn't do or good go anywhere itself, right? Um, so that and this is the crucial point: any motion we can observe or detect, any order, that is anything that has become differentiated and then put into a kind of a that shows up in a kind of an order or arrangement, like you know, I'm a human being and I have hands and. I have parents and you guys, you know, have siblings and we live in a world with trees and things when we drop them fall. Every single one of those particular orders and arrangements, any regularity, right? I mean, isn't it amazing every generation of human being, every generation of animal that procreates in this way, that reproduces in this way, um, you know, the same forms show up in the next generation. You don't end up with like a completely different thing. You don't have human beings giving birth to cacti, for example. I mean, it's just not, doesn't want, not what happens. All of that particularity, I mean, go back, cast your mind back to the, to the reference of, did you see something and is it good, right? All of any, but any motion, any order, any regularity requires a cause. Remember that you, know, you can't get something from nothing, nihil ex nihilo, right? Nothing comes from nothing. Um, if you see any order or regularity or motion at all, because matter itself, if you left it alone, if there wasn't anything affecting it, causing it to do something, it would just sit there like a lump, doing nothing, right? Either the cause of motion and matter, or the re motion, etc., order, regularity, has to be necessity, to use that term that I just spent a lot of time on, Bentley rejects that, or it's chance atomism bentley rejects that or thirdly it's choice planning and design answer yes so bentley and newton are going to reject necessity they're going to reject chance and they're going to opt for as i've already suggested choice planning and design however when they do that they're doing it on the on, on a foundation of referring to evidence you know empirical evidence about the way things are in the actual world. From our perspective, and from a lot of people's perspectives, they're not requiring much, however, for their evidence. All you have to be able to see is that there is anything in motion, anything that falls into a particular order, any regularity, anything that's consistent, like the sun coming up every day, right? I mean, anything, anything that's consistent or, or moving at all is enough evidence 
to show choice planning and design. So they've got themselves a really low bar and they need that bar because they're basically delivering mechanical physical theory of natural phenomena. And so they, but they, not atheistical theory, not a, so this is the PR machine, right? Signs of de design and choice are evidence against the atheists of a powerful benevolent creator, AKA God. So that's, that's our conclusion here. Um, now that's for Bentley. Let's look now at Newton, um, who, um, who is writing these letters, as I said, to Bentley while Bentley is writing his eight sermons, okay? Um, he's finalizing sermons seven and eight for publication when the letters are taking place. That's a, that's, we have history and scholarship that, that show that. Uh, it takes also, in addition, in addition to the other sort of um, uh, historical context here, this is crucial in terms of understanding a little bit of what's going on when we get to Leibniz Clark correspondence next week. Um, the correspondence here between Bentley and Newton, right, right between, you know, while Bentley's finalizing Sermon 7 and 8, we read 8, right, for publication now, for publication, this, it takes place about 20 years, about 20 years before the open dispute with Leibniz over the calculus. Leibniz and Newton very famously argued over who invented the calculus first. They both invented it. Um, the, the consensus today uh, is generally that they both came up with most of it independently. Um, obviously they were seeing each other's bits and pieces of each other's work, um, but, the, but the upshot is that they both more or less came up with it independently. Um, Newton, who wasn't a particularly pleasant person, um, uh, anonymously wrote a, a, what was supposed to be a Royal Society report on the dispute that he has with Leibniz. So he's a party to the dispute, but he secretly writes the, basically the judicial opinion in, you know, uh, judge scientists, scientist judges, saying, oh, you know, it was Newton. And that comes out of the Royal Society in England. Remember, Newton is, a, Newton is an English person. Leibniz is living in Hanover, which will be important when we get to the correspondence next week. Um, the geography is going to be, geography is going to become crucial when we, when we turn to the actual correspondence and we start looking at Leibniz and his life. Um, this, so, so Newton secretly writes this report for the, it's supposed to be the subjective report by the Royal Society, but it's Newton taking his own side in the calculus dispute, saying, oh, it was Newton, Leibniz, you know, he's, his claims are unfounded. Um, so Newton, Newton, Newton is, um, he's, he's, got, he's got views on, on, on subjects, and he's not, he doesn't, he's not above, you know, playing dirty to advance them, basically. Um, so it's about 20 years before that happens, and it's about 25 years before Leibniz exchange with Newton's friend and neighbor, Samuel Clark. So, Samuel, so Clark and Newton actually live close to each other. They're friends, they're neighbors. Clark was um, uh, Newton's um, local religious leader. Um, he's, he's his vicar, to, if we're going to be precise about it. But you might say, those of you who grew up in the Catholic Church, Clark was Newton's priest. Uh, you know, it's, it's the wrong side of, pro, pro, for, of Christianity. These are Protestants, but it's the same structure. The same same uh, organizational structure, roughly. Um, so Clark is Newton's religious leader, local religious leader, uh, and um, so this 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 exchange that he has with Bentley is is taking place about twenty five years before that. So this is this is sort of forming backdrop in a couple of different ways for the uh, for the Leibniz Clark correspondence, also in that respect. Um, Bentley and Newton give us. One angle, and this is going to be the emphasis, this is going to be the thing I emphasize in, in the rest of this lecture, one angle on what reason in the so-called age of reason, now it's big zooming out for the, for the philosophical modernity class, well, what is the age of reason? Newton and Bentley are giving us one angle on what, what, what we mean here by reason, and I'll say more about this in just a bit. That is, what is rational in rationalism and what's modern in modernity? Okay, so we're going to see... And, you know, bearing in mind that all of this is in the, th the service of, like, heavily theological scientific endeavor, meaning we're not doing this science if we can't have our theology firmly supported by that science. Just a reminder, what's pre-modern, back when we were looking at astrology and so forth, pagan, European pagan, polytheistic, magical, mythological, animistic world of multiple spirits 
essences of things, diverse and crowded spiritual nature. It's, it looks a lot more like, you know, cultures. This is what Europe, Europe was just like any other culture um, with its, you know, its plethora of deities and spirits and essences um, before the advent of this period that we're studying in this class. Europe just looked, you know, just like any other culture um, in this sort of pagan, polytheistic, multiple deities and forces and animistic spirits world. Um, remember, it includes planets and constellations. You know, what's your sign? Um, go back to the astrology article all the way at the beginning of the of the of the semester. You know, here you know here are people explaining all of their lives by reference to the position of their planets at their birth or at particular events and so on. Constellations: the sun, the moon, comets, planets named for gods and polytheistic religions the world over, as we saw in the first week of class. We know them from Greek mythology, with names of Greek and Roman gods, Jupiter and Saturn, um, Roman versions of these, um, pre-Christian, pre-monotheistic generally. So this is, you know, this is the world, Europe before Christianity, and popular Europe for hundreds of years while, while Christianity is, is, is the predominant sort of state religion. There aren't states necessarily, but it's the religion of the, of the, of the, of the princes and the monarchs and so on. Um, regular people held on to the older views for hundreds and hundreds of years. It's why, it's one of the ways, if you start paying attention to the differences in Christianity and different cultures, not just in um, post-colonial cultures, but also in Europe proper, what you're seeing in part is the showing through of the pre-existing pagan cultures, which, you know, got themselves legitimated by getting sort of stuck under, you know, a particular um, subset of Christian ritual. This is, you know, the the particular saints in particular countries. If you go and you look at the worship and the the uh, the, uh, the, the the tradition around those saints in, in in different countries in different places, what you're seeing in part is the the pre-Christian pagan polytheistic um, culture sort of just sort of you know getting getting cover under the the, the focus on a particular saint because it, you know it's culturally specific. Um, a lot of that stuff got relocated there the, when um, when Europe sort of, the, particularly the regular people, ordinary people in Europe, got sort of adjusted to Christianity. It you know it takes hundreds of years for people to give up what were before you know their major religion. It was a it was a massively religious culture, you know, varying from loca by location before Christianity arrives in Europe. Um, just, just like, just like in any other part of the world. I mean, the, 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 for those of you with family origins in Central or South America, we're quite vividly aware of, you know, what happened when Christianity arrives with the conquest and how it affects Mesoamerican religion and, you know, the pre-existing religious culture uh, uh, in, the, in of the peoples in these various places. Uh, and, and, it, and it affects the way, ca the way Catholicism looks in, in, in those places even today. Um, uh, so this is, you know, this, so this is our, this is our pre-Christian backdrop. The, just a reminder, the great conjunction has echoes of personal, individual, idiosyncratic gods. I mean, Jupiter and Saturn have these personalities. Remember, we talked about that weeks and weeks ago. Um, they have feuds. They have conflicts, special powers. They have family relations, and this is why something like the Great Conjunction is a tr is, is assigned as a cause to plagues and pandemics. So that's a reminder about our um, pre-modern background, while we dive into Newton's correspondence with Bentley. Matter in motion metaphysics makes it possible, not necessary but possible to explain the world and everything in it by the properties of matter acting under general universal physical laws, as we saw with Descartes in the world. However, Descartes, you know, holds quite tightly to God as the cause of all of, all of those laws. He puts matter into motion and he imposes the laws of nature. So, you know, Descartes, it's not an anti-theological view. It's just not one that these guys, the, the Royal Society guys like Newton and Bentley, Bentley and Clark find satisfying. Um, particles in space are a void, AKA a vacuum, as I've already just suggested, or denser, more discrete bodies like planets moved about by finer, lighter particles in vortices of matter as we saw with Descartes' The World. Um, and this is just an example of you know, these two different kinds of theories. Either theory explains all of nature, including the sun, the moon, the planets, and the stars. But there's a danger, which I've already suggested, um, that those explanations could be enough. 
and um, that they support the conclusion of atheism. And notice that this is an atheism that could simply be what we call an agnosticism. Maybe God created all of this, maybe he didn't, you know, to speak from, the, from inside one of the monotheisms, right? Um, that, uh, that's a, agnosticism says we don't know, atheism says we do know and he doesn't exist and he didn't cause all of this. These guys called everybody atheistic. If you, if were, you made the slightest departure from, you know, theological Christian doctrine, it was considered a form of atheism. Um, and, and the other thing is they got, they, these guys used the term atheism to sling back and forth at each other when they were criticizing each other's physical theories. So it's also them's fighting words as well as an actual position that anybody anywhere actually ever took. Um, okay, bearing in mind, as we, as we just saw, um, Bentley's double-barreled criticism of atheist explanations of natural phenomena, blind mechanism or necessity on the one hand, blind chance on the other, Emphasis on blindness because the claim that is that something blind, unplanned, unconscious, mechanical, or random cannot cause something that is ordered, regular, consistent, intricate, and above all successful, as we saw with um, when, when we were looking at Bentley just a few minutes ago. Um, notice that here, even though Descartes assigns the imposition of the laws of nature and um, the, the, the fact that the matter in the world is in motion to God as a cause, necessarily. Um, he does leave, he does say that God puts matter into motion and he preserves it in each instant of its subsequent motion without being responsible for the particular state, without without um, causing or being responsible for the particular state that matter is in. So the motion, the size, the shape, the direction of particles of matter on the one hand, and then you remember from last week when I was talking to you guys about the problem of evil, the things that people do using their free will, um, God creates and sustains us, but he's not responsible for our bad choices. And this is how you can have sin, you can have original sin, and this is how you can have evil in the world. Um, this is when Descartes says that God is, you know, uh, and this is this is the this is what lies behind. This is the actual philosophical position that lies behind the phrase Deus ex machina. God sets it in motion and then walks off. Descartes' position sort of led to that criticism. I mean, it's, it can be criticized in those terms because God isn't committed and isn't responsible for the particular things that happen afterwards. He's just all right. Matter in motion, laws. Y'all take care of this. Not even miracles, right? Remember. Um, 